All right, so uh, show of hands, does anyone know who this is? You're awesome. <laughs> That's right. So for, those, for everyone else here who had no idea who that was, uh, this is Shigeru Miyamoto, um, and he's kind of an amazing character. And he's known specifically for a couple things. Um, most notably, he invented Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> and uh, he also created Legend of Zelda, which in my mind actually might be a better game. But uh, there was a New Yorker piece about Shigeru Miyamoto about two years ago or so. Um, and he talks a little bit about why what he created was so special. And one of the things he points to, if you think about Super Mario Brothers, it's this very simple two-dimensional world I think demographically, like everyone here has played this game, right? Uh, um, anyway, it's a very simple game. You just run through a 2D world jumping around. And uh, what he cites as uh, the sort of the strength and the staying power of this video game is the fact that, for example, uh, if Mario jumps up a little to the left over here, uh, a bean sprout pops out. And you can jump on that bean sprout and climb into another world. Or you can go down that green tube and all of a sudden, you know, you're in this whole other world. And so he's infused into this game this sense that the, uh, that the architecture of the game is actually infinite and that there's all sorts of secrets uh, down there in the video game that, uh, that maybe you haven't discovered yet. And the very simple analogy is that our cities are very much like this as well. Um, it's maybe a little bit hackneyed to say this, but, our, but the city, especially a city of any age, is a palimpsest. It's a city on top of a city on top of a city on top of a city. And uh, as we sort of go through our daily lives in these, you know, in these environments, uh, the vestiges of all those previous cities are right there underfoot. And I think this is a quality that really uh, lends uh, most of our cities, our older cities especially, uh, makes them beautiful and, and gives them the richness and complexity that actually makes them endlessly enjoyable, like Super Mario Brothers. So sometimes, and this is, this is a project about New York City, so all the images I will show uh, are about uh, New York City. Uh, but certainly I think very similar things could be said of uh, any city of, of age in this country or others. Um, sometimes, uh, if you know where to look, the city will just peel back another layer of the onion and uh, reveal another secret to you. And in this particular instance, this is in Brooklyn, but um, there are moments when you could simply climb down a manhole cover and emerge into crazy underground spaces. Uh, this space in particular is uh, the Williamsburg Trolley Terminal, which is the site of the low line. So this is a space that uh, is situated at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge, and hundreds of thousands of people traverse this bridge every day, going right over this site, and have really no idea that this uh, uh, very large space uh, is actually down there. It's an old space. It was built at the turn of the last century. If you look at the image that I'm showing, uh, you'll note in the distance there's some guys in fedoras uh, being 1930s guys. And, uh, you know, I think that they help to give a sense of the scale, the sheer scale of this space. It's about 60,000 square feet or an acre and change. Uh, and it's just sitting there under the surface of the street and very few people have any inkling that it's even down there. This is its current state today. Um, its use was discontinued when the automobile totally won and they discontinued uh, streetcar service in 1948. I think uh, an important thing to note is, uh, that it, is that this space actually has any number of historical qualities. It has all the qualities of a space that was built at the turn of the last century, uh, including, well, cobblestone floors, uh, ironwork, um, all sorts of catenary line detail, et cetera. And it's really kind of a magical historical space. This is the uh, space at present day uh, during one of, one of the tours that the MTA led Dan and I on. So just for a little bit of context, I don't know if anyone here knows Manhattan at all, but uh, on the right side of this image uh, is, the Williams, uh, is the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, this is the Lower East Side. This is actually a very important neighborhood uh, historically, uh, really not just in New York, but in this country in general. It was really the first, when you got off the ferry or the boat and, and you know, went through immigration in Ellis Island, probably the first place you were coming was this neighborhood. And so this is a neighborhood uh, with a very rich cultural heritage and a very rich history, and one that's been occupied by numerous ethnic groups uh, over the years. Uh, uh, in this particular image, you'll see also, and this is something I want to call attention to, uh, two things, the scale of this space, and also the fact that 
the, uh, the surrounding area is almost completely raised, right? So what was once a very uh, a thriving immigrant neighborhood no longer exists, uh, and via various uh, misguided urbanist um, efforts, uh, the entire area has been sort of c consistently and systematically overlooked and raised, knocked down, and neglected. This is the, na the neighborhood of, uh, of the Lower East Side politically, just a very simple graphic indicating sort of the lack of green space that really stems from that systemic neglect that this neighborhood has experienced. Now, this is a, this is a condition that's actually historical. And uh, at the turn of the last century, a fellow named Jacob Reese wrote a book called uh, How the Other Hath Lives. And this is an image from that book. Um, it, it's not a very good quality image, and I apologize for that. But in this image, what you see is a bunch of children playing in a feces-filled gutter uh, next to a rotting horse, right? And I think that this was a very compelling image at the time, as it still is now, and actually indicative of, of the idea that this, this is a neighborhood that historically has not had any public space. And indeed, on to our current day, uh, it's still one that's almost empty of public space, especially green space. So how do we take this neighborhood, this, uh, this, this one particular node of a historic neighborhood and begin to perhaps use this amazing space to begin to stitch, stitch back together a tear in the urban fabric. One of the, uh, well, Dan and I believe that one of the answers to this lies in design and technology. And so this is a very simple diagram of what we're proposing, but you can effectively gather sunlight, treat it like a liquid, and channel it through tubes and deliver it to another location. And this is not, necessarily speaking, a new technology or new concept, but it's one, that, uh, it's one that we hope to employ in various manners in actually bringing natural sunlight into this old, forgotten underground space. So this is a prototype, simply. Me testing out the prototype, and lo and behold, it works. And so this is a concept that actually functions, and we can actually transmit the light that plants need to photosynthesize. And so if we take a space, this is, uh, this is maybe last March after a snow melt, and apply, just in a very simple fashion, this technological concept to the space, it becomes this. Or for that matter, this. Now, we view this as an opportunity, um, just really kind of a once in a generation opportunity to take a space located at really a crossroads and a nexus of several different modes of transportation, several different uh, ethnicities, and to use technology and design to actually begin to weave the fabric of a community back together. And in doing so, actually to create a landmark for the neighborhood and also uh, to cherish, uh, ter cherish our collective history. So there's more to it, i.e. how do you take an image like that and actually make it a reality? And so Dan's gonna chime in on that. All right, let's see, can I, can I not use the mic? Does my, does Mine my... is the only one not working. Am I good? All right, that's really great, because my, my wrist is broken. I need this. Yeah. Um, so that would make it really awkward. Um, OK, so uh, right now, swirling in all of your heads are probably a lot of questions around the viability of this project, right? Uh, and as we got this idea out into the public, really just last fall, a lot of uh, interest uh, really came our way from people really around the world. And a lot of really tough questions came to us too. Really sort of, how, how are you really going to build the world's first underground park? So what we've done over the course of the last year is to focus on answering those questions really in earnest uh, through really engaging both the right brains and the left brains, people who are asking about uh, the project itself. So the first thing that we did is to actually do a deep uh, feasibility study, a planning study with some of the world's best experts who have actually helped uh, uh, parks and organizations like the High Line and, um, and, and other uh, sort of public spaces help think through the, the question of, of how you transform an abandoned space into something that could become uh, a new public park. And the good news is that a lot of these public spaces share a lot of things in common. In fact, uh, it's actually really interesting, and I would actually ask you all to think about some of your favorite public spaces. Uh, everything from uh, the need for food and beverage uh, the possibilities and the opportunities to have w what's both called passive recreation and uh, more programmed experiences uh, in the form of cultural events and, uh, and even using the space as a rentable uh, uh, environment. 
uh, what the earliest uh, uh, studies have, have really pointed to is not only the viability of the space as a popular cultural amenity, but also a space that actually would be able to help fund itself from the first day of its operation. I think an important part of this also is looking at the kind of value that a public space like this could, would be able to generate. And it's a lot easier to see some of these values after a park or a public space is built and introduced to the public. But it's sometimes more challenging to imagine this when you're looking at um, a rotten, dilapidated, uh, abandoned trolley terminal. But these are the kinds of things that our study really did point to. Uh, and the Lower East Side, that's what LES stands for, uh, is uh, definitely a neighborhood that is lacking, as James mentioned, in open space. And that's actually a, a trend that will only continue with the, the, the plan of uh, over a million and a half new units of development slated for uh, the space just adjacent to our site. Uh, a ton of additional opportunities as well in terms of building a neighborhood uh, that both supports the current and existing local businesses, but also provides new opportunities for destination for cultural events. I think more broadly, and this is something that really resonates uh, quite a bit in New York City and I know in Chicago and in cities around the world, is uh, the real excitement that is generated uh, among uh, many different kinds of audiences around doing something for the first time. And so one of the things that we think we really are hopefully will be able to tap into is this question of if we're going to build an underground park using solar technology, why shouldn't it be in New York? <laughs> um, and then I think the, the larger question too for us is looking at all of the many opportunities for reusing our spaces underneath our cities. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have any guesses about the number of uh, acres underneath New York City that have been dug out at some point but are actually not in use. Any guesses? 800 acres, that's massive. Um, that would be cool. But it, it's actually 13 acres of spaces that are, under, that are, that are uh, just waiting for uh, some kind of new life. And uh, our site, which James mentioned, is um, uh, roughly one acre in size, uh, is, is really something uh, special that should be thought about seriously. Uh, as James mentioned, this is something that I think really does tie together a lot of the opportunities uh, that we have to, to, to really celebrate some of the past of New York City. This is the uh, largest existing um, um, self-contained relic of the streetcar era in New York City. So there are these things, these Belgian blocks, or you know, otherwise known as cobblestones, uh, these rail tracks, these catenaries, which are, are just simply the tracks on the ceiling uh, to which the trolleys were attached. Uh, and then these, these historic control offices where we fantasized about transforming them into kids' tree houses. Uh, as well as taking all of that history, thinking about ways to celebrate that from a design perspective, while also integrating an element of technology that would really do something new and, uh, and would really elevate the conversation around what solar technology can do in our cities. So uh, I mentioned our, the right brain, right brain and the left brain. So on the left brain side, it's really important for people to sort of visualize the, uh, the low line as a concept and also to be able to answer basic questions about how actually can you bring sunlight indoors or underground and also what kinds of green plants, trees, and, and, and sort of species would actually be able to grow in an underground environment. So what we did this year, we actually raised a record-setting uh, Kickstarter campaign uh, to, uh, to help fund the development of a public exhibition that we actually just closed only a few weeks ago. And here is uh, a, a vision of, uh, or an image of our, our installation of the actual exhibit itself. Um, here you can see a scissor lift and what ended up becoming um, a 30 foot by 30 foot by 20 foot solar canopy that uh, was hoisted to the ceiling of an abandoned warehouse on the Lower East Side. And uh, we use that to sort of help demonstrate how the solar technology would work and also uh, what kinds of green life could, could exist underneath that site. So here is the, the space when it was completed. And this was an exhibit that opened really uh, less than a month ago, actually. And uh, what you can see is the, the raised solar canopy. Those are um, uh, several hundred individual pieces of anodized aluminum. Uh, that were cut into uh, hexagonal shapes and um, uh, assembled by hand, hoisted by hand to the ceiling, connected to a, um, uh, a series of solar collectors installed on the roof. Uh, and the light was then channeled and funneled below the surface of the roof and indoors using uh, this reflective solar canopy. Uh, beneath the solar canopy, you see a, a small mock-up of what a green space could look like in, in uh, a space like the low line. 
And here we have a 500 pound Japanese maple, a series of uh, ferns and mosses, and actually we had some mushrooms and even a praying mantis that lived uh, throughout the entire exhibit uh, in the actual space itself, who we promptly named Zoltan. <laughs> here are some really beautiful images of the space. These are actual real photographs, not architectural renderings. Um, and it was something where uh, uh, really people were able to interact with and connect with the technology and the idea in a, in a, in a really imaginative and dreamlike state. This is the view sort of looking uh, straight up to the ceiling. Again, this is, this is an actual photograph. It was actually impossible to take a bad picture of this thing. Here's another shot. So you can see the um, sort of creation of how uh, uh, this space can be magically transformed. Uh, another thing that we're really proud of is that we uh, actually had access to this warehouse. It was a warehouse space with 15,000 square feet, and as you saw, uh, the exhibit took up a sizable portion of the space, but, but really didn't take over the entire warehouse. So what we did was we invited the community into the space for a wide variety of events and activities. We had sort of gallery hours. We had over 11,000 visitors come in and visit the, the space, um, which kept us on pace with some of, the, uh, some of New York City's top museums in terms of volume. Uh, we did over four design talks. We had three different schools come and visit the space. Uh, so we were able to actually get little kids and high school students actually engaging with the concept. Um, actually, my favorite thing about this, does anybody have any guesses what the number one ask from uh, middle schoolers and high school kids was, actually not, not high school kids, elementary school kids was uh, in terms of what uh, they would want to see in the, in the future park? Skateboarding? Ice cream? Actually, it was amazing. The kids in unison chanted that they wanted swings, and actually hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, which actually sounds horrifyingly scary uh, if you think about it. But um, uh, th that was the kind, exactly the kind of feedback that we wanted to generate, is sort of really uh, hearing directly from, um, from ordinary folks and, and really sort of building in what we hope to continue to grow, which is a very participatory design process. Uh, we also had street fairs. This is an image from one of uh, the, uh, the days in which we literally just took the Sunday and invited in some of the most popular local businesses uh, so that people could not only come and see the exhibit, but also uh, drink coffee uh, or my personal favorite, which was uh, to eat meatballs. Uh, there was a, a meatball shop is a really popular space on the Lower East Side. And we also had a, a rally in which uh, a, a series of our local uh, uh, political, uh, well, actually our city council people actually were, uh, hosted an event in honor of the low line to really drum up and generate interest among uh, folks from across the community. So it really was an opportunity to see the broad grassroots support and, and really the energy that we were building around the, around the idea. So uh, the low line actually is a name that we, I'm, I'm, I think it's fair to say we didn't actually choose this name. This name actually came to us uh, uh, at, because in New York City, I imagine many of you guys are familiar with the High Line Park in, uh, on the, the west side of, of Manhattan. It's a, I think it's fair to say it's New York City's pop, most popular park right now. And the most recent addition to the city, it's also a shining example of the reclamation of a uh, you know, abandoned, in, in, in that case, elevated rail, rail uh, terminal uh, or railway. And uh, as we uh, sort of shared the idea with more and more folks over the last several years, uh, people sort of said, oh, it's sort of like a low line. It's kind of like, a, it's like the high line, but it's the low line. And uh, that was something that obviously had a, had a lot of currency and it's valuable for us in being able to explain what the project is. So that's really inspiring and I think we're very honored to be in that category because I would personally call the high line one of the, the most exciting uh, examples of social entrepreneurship in the urban design field in, in quite some time. Uh, but it, is, uh, it also is a lot to live up to. Um, what I'll leave you with is that I think what we have is, uh, it's, it's certainly not an imitation, uh, but it is really something that I think is very different. It engages solar technology in a way that I think could be, really be transformative for the space uh, and for design and for uh, the question of how um, urban planners uh, think about public spaces. Uh, I also think that what it provides is an opportunity to uh, reimagine and think about the potential magic that we have below our streets. And, um, and so hopefully that is the idea that we, that we leave with all of you today. So thanks very much. And thanks to the um, conference for having us.